He was one of the most notable figures in the Philadelphia crime family as an associate. He was working up the ranks in the crime family ladder. He would be friends with one, killed with one, and unfortunately, died by one. This is the story of Vincent Falcone. The Beginning Vincent Falcone was born on November 8, 1949. There is not much documents nor public record about Falcone's life. However, we will use some sources from Philadelphia journalist George Anastasia and from Philip Leonetti, who was Vincent Falcone's one-time right-hand man and his assassin from his book, Mafia Prince. Vincent Falcone was reported to be born in Argentina in Latin America, and his parents were of Italian descent. As he grown from a boy to a man, Vincent Falcone and his family moved to the United States to live the American dream. However, everybody's vision of the American dream is very different. Vincent Falcone was close with his mother, Rosaria Falcone, but we have no reports about the relationship of his father. Vincent Falcone was built between 5 foot 8 inches to 9 inches. He had dark brown hair and a thick dark brown mustache. However, he had a receding hairline that was the shape of a horseshoe. He was young in his late 20s to find a decent profession after he was married to a woman. Vincent Falcone, his mother and wife would later settle by moving into the neighborhoods of New Jersey to see many Italian families begin an honest living such as being chefs, fishermen, businessmen, and more. On the contrary, he will also be around people who stole, robbed, and kill as well for a living. One mobster that would change Vincent Falcone's life would be seen in the neighborhood often. That mobster was Nicodemo, Little Nicky Scarfo. Vincent Falcone will also be a businessman in his own right and worked as a cement contractor. However, when him and Nicky Scarfo had did business, Scarfo had more interest than just cement. The Hit Cement contractor Vincent Falcone thought he was in a good position to cash in on the casino gambling boom that occurred in the late 1970s that was sweeping across Atlantic City several decades ago. Falcone saw construction all over the city and figured he'd be able to get a piece of the action. However, while he was sharing drinks with some friends at an apartment on Dickiter Street in Margate, New Jersey, until one fatal night. The Hitman Here we will quote from Philip Leonetti's Mafia Prince. The two local cement contractors named Alfredo Ferraro and Vincent Falcone who had befriended both Scarfo and Leonetti who were constantly in their presence and a busy savvy street smart Jewish gangster named Saul Kane who had relocated to the Jersey Shore from North Philly, rounded out the core of Nicky Scarfo's Atlantic City crew in the mid-1970s. I used to hang around a lot with Vincent Falcone, me and Lawrence, referring to Lawrence Merlino. He was with me the night at the sandbar and I had problems with his motorcycle guys. Vince was a few years older than me and he was married, but he used to go out and drink several nights a week. He always had a lot to say, he was very opinionated, and had a big of an ego. Vince was always complaining about money, who he owed, who owed him, how much he was making, how much other guys were making, and just constantly complain. My uncle liked him, but he would always say, he's not Costa Nostra, meaning he didn't have the right mindset or attitude, referring to the Mafia in Philadelphia. Well, referring to the Mafia in the United States. 
Alfredo was a bit older and he and Vince were very close. Their families had come to the United States together from Argentina. They were both Italian, but they were from Argentina. My uncle, he said things like, these two guys, they're not like us, meaning they didn't think like us. Both Alfredo and Vince were cement contractors and Alfredo had taught me the ins and outs of, of the concrete business. Now Saul Cain was a character. He loved Meyer Lansky and he was Jewish, so we called him Meyer. Years later, my uncle arranged for Saul to meet Meyer Lansky down in Florida. It was like a Catholic priest meeting the Pope. Saul was in heaven. Saul was a great guy and a lot of fun to be with. He owned a bar in Atlantic City, my way lounge, and he worked as a bail bondsman. He used to hang out a lot with me and Lawrence, either at my way or Teddy's worst end lounge on Trenton Avenue. My uncle loved Saul and he would like to do business with Bobby Mann, tapped his index finger to his head, meaning Saul was smart, but he say he can never get this, and he rubbed his thumb and index finger together, meaning his button, because he was Jewish and not Italian. In this thing, the kosher notion you had to be 100% Italian to be made, and that was one of the rules. We could do business with Saul, and he could do business with us, but he can never get straightened out and become a full-fledged member. As Scarfo continued to build his mob crew, Atlantic City, the down-and-out seaside resort which Scarfo controlled, was about to be brought back to life with legalized casino gambling coming to a town a way to stimulate the once thriving resort. Overnight, both Scarfo's and Atlantic City's futures began to look much brighter. The First Hit Lawrence Marlino was a great guy, and like his brother Chucky, he was very loyal to my uncle. He and I were very closer in age, so we spent a lot of time together. One time I was at a bar in Atlantic City with Vince Falcone and a few girls, and I got into a fight with some kid who was involved in the local motorcycle gang. This kid, Louis DeMarco, was robbing Chicky Narducci's crap games in Philadelphia. Chicky Narducci was one of Angelo Bruno's top guys. Angelo Bruno, who was the godfather of Philadelphia at this time, just for full disclosure. His crowd games brought in a lot of money for the family. So Chicky Narducci goes and sees Phil Testa and Angelo Bruno and makes a beef about what is going on. Bruno and Testa tell Narducci that they're going to find Louis DeMarco and have him killed. Disrespecting a made guy is against the rules, and Chicky Narducci was a made guy. So what happened is, Phil Testa waits a week before calling my uncle and telling him that he wants us to kill Louis DeMarco for robbing Chicky Narducci. Phil Testa and Chicky Narducci had kind of a love and hate relationship, so they were always on again, off again, and then they were having problems, so Phil Testa was kind of dogging it. My uncle was unhappy because Phil Testa waited a week and didn't tell him right away. My uncle wanted people to know what kind of people we were, that if we were Asked to kill someone, we would do the ray without any hesitation. Our philosophy was bang bang, and that was that. So my uncle assigns the killing to me and Vincent Falcone so we can prove to my uncle and the guys like Ange and Phil Testa that we were killers and that we were serious men like my uncle. So we put some feelers out on the street to see if anyone has a line where this Louis DeMarco might be hiding out. We hear that he is staying at the inside motel on Pacific Avenue. So I go see a guy and I know named Harry the Hat who had a coffee shop on Missouri Avenue. It was like hanging out. It was like a hangout. Everybody would hang there. Harry the Hat was skinny with Razor's brother-in-law and he knew everybody in Atlanta City. So I asked him if he knows who Louis DeMarco is and Harry the Hat pointed him out to me. He was actually sitting right there in the coffee shop playing cards. So I have Vince Falcone with me and we stay out for a while. And we stay for a little while. And when Louis DeMarco leaves, we follow him to the inside motel. He has no idea who we are or that we are following him. There was a local bartender who was with us who had a room at the inside. He gave us the key to the room so that we could wait until DeMarco came out of his room. 
so we can get him. Phil Leonetti, just 23 years old, was about to commit his first murder. Assigns the killing to me and Vincent Falcone so we can prove to my uncle and guys like Angie and Phil Tester that we were killers and that we were serious men like my uncle. Louis DeMarco was robbing Chicky Narducci and Chicky Narducci was in our family. Louis DeMarco had broken the rules and when you break the rules, you get killed. This is what my uncle had always taught me. This is what LaCosha Nosha was all about. Before the money, before the power, before everything came the rules. Louis DeMarco was getting ready to leave his room at the Ensign Motel and he had no idea what was coming. So we see him walking out and we run up on him. Me and Vince had masks and gloves on. We were behind him and he blasted right in the back of his head. After I shot him, I thought he was running away, but it was the force of the bullet that made him fly forward and he landed face down. Then me and Vince just empty our guns into him. I think the first shot killed him. We did it right at the parking lot, right on the Pacific in broad daylight. I remember standing over him and emptying my gun into him. I remember the feeling I had. I felt cold. I didn't feel any remorse. Louis DeMarco was dead and Phil Leonetti was now a bona fide mob killer, just like his uncle. Nicky Scarfo. My uncle had me and Vince go over an escape route a few days before the killing. We walked over the route several times to make sure we were knew we were going. We walked several routes several times to make sure we knew where we were going. My uncle told us that after we killed him, he wanted us to throw the guns on the roof of a nearby building, which we did. We then followed the route that we had planned and my uncle was waiting there in a car to pick us up. We get in the car and no one says a word. We just drive to the apartment on Georgia Avenue. As Nicky Scarfo became more of a force in Lakota Nosha, he started to distance himself from members of the Atlantic City crew that he thought were dead weight. Two men who fit that description were Alfredo Ferraro and Vincent Falcone, both of whom had been trusted members of Nicky Scarfo's gang since the early 70s. My uncle decided he didn't want either of them around us anymore. He would say things like, these two guys are useless, or these two guys are holding us back. He grew to detest both of them. What happened next is vintage Nicky Scarfo. Now Alfredo and Vince were the best of friends. They were Italian, but they came to the United States from Argentina and they came over together. The Big Shot December 16th, 1979 Vincent Falcone and Alfredo Ferraro had talked about Nicky Scarfo at a bar while Scarfo was traveling overseas in Italy. Chucky Marlino had informed Nicky Scarfo, Philip Leonetti, that Vincent Falcone and Alfredo Ferraro were making jokes about their business deals, especially when it came to the cement work. When Nicky Scarfo was first informed, he said, I'm a whack them both. When Nicky Scarfo had returned from Italy and then started doing business with the crime family in New Jersey, Alfredo Ferraro is starting to feel the tension and then disappears in the scenery. And then eventually so did Vincent Falcone. But as time went on, Vincent Falcone does eventually show up and start making business deals and everybody pretend that nothing has happened. And this is where Nicky Scarfo makes the shrewd move by playing the plot of killing Vincent Falcone. To Nicky Scarfo, killing the big shot as he referred to Vincent Falcone had become personal, just like he did with Judge Helfont. Scarfo set out to lure Falcone into a comfort zone when he at least expected it. Now around this time, a position opens up in the concrete union and my uncle puts the word out that he wants Vincent Falcone to get it. This was a big deal and something that Vince had always wanted. So my uncle sets the trap and Vince goes for it. My uncle is acting like everything is fine and now Vince starts to come around Georgia Avenue again. We were playing like nothing ever happened. They were very close, these two. So my uncle decided that he wanted to kill Alfredo and then he wanted Vince to be the shooter. Now if Vince doesn't kill Alfredo, my uncle will have him killed. And then we kill Alfredo anyway. 
It's like killing two birds with one stone. So my uncle gives Vince the order to kill Alfredo, and right away Vince is dogging it, making up excuses. Alfredo must have started getting vibes and then he just disappears. He stops coming into Atlantic City. We stop seeing him, but one night Vince is out drinking with Alfredo and Chucky and Lawrence bump into them and they both get a drink and they tell Chucky and Lawrence that my uncle is crazy and that we shouldn't be in the concrete business. A few days later, my uncle and Chucky end up going on vacation together to Italy and while they are there, Chucky tells my uncle what Vince and Alfredo has said about us. And so begins the plot to kill Vince Falcone. My uncle never really liked Vince. He didn't think he was cut out for La Cosa Nostra. My uncle would say about Vince and Alfredo, they are not meant for this thing, meaning La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. Now Alfredo had stopped coming around. He even stopped doing business in Atlantic City with his concrete company. And even though my uncle wanted to kill him, it wasn't a top priority at the time. But now with Vincent Falcone not following orders and then talking subversive to Chucky and Lawrence about me and my uncle, my uncle became obsessed with killing him. He used to call Vince the big shot when he spoke about killing him. he said things like, we're going to show the big shot who's in charge, things like that. Vince had been long enough to know how my uncle was. And I think he knew that we were going to kill him. So like Alfredo did, Vince stopped coming around. Now at the time, Vince was married, but he was seeing a young girl who lived on Georgia Avenue, right across the street from us. This girl's name was Maria. She and her family had moved from South Philadelphia to Ducktown, just like we had. She was a beautiful young Italian girl with dark hair and a pretty face. Now if Vince would pick her up or drop her off, he would never drive down to Georgia Avenue because he knew we wanted to kill him. I used to tell her that Vince was no good and that she should stop seeing him. But she was young and she didn't listen to me. There was something special about this girl. Even back then I felt it. But not every murder had to take place right away. Some were business, like Louis DeMarco and Pepe Leva murders. And some were personal, like the Judge Helfont killing. To Nikki Scarfo, Killing the big shot, Vincent Falcone had become personal, and just like he did with Judge Halfon, Scarfo set out to lull Falcone into a comfort zone and then kill him when he least expected it. Now around this time, a position opens up with the Concrete Union. We are playing like nothing happened. Me, Chucky, Lawrence, The Blade, and Vince is doing the same because he wants to be the boss of the company. Now at this time, Alfredo isn't around anymore and Vince is hanging with a kid from South Philadelphia named Joe Salerno, who was a plumber. Me, Chucky, Lawrence, The Blade, and Vince is doing the same business because he really wants to be the boss of the concrete union. Joe Salerno had borrowed $10,000 from me and my uncle and was paying us two and a half points or $250 per week in interest on top of the $10,000 he owed us. It was a standard juice loan and at the time we were doing a lot of loan sharking. Every week I'd go out and pick up envelopes or guys who came from our office. Everybody paid because they knew our reputation. These type of loans were our bread and butter. With the holiday approaching and the promise of a new job waiting for him in the new year, Vince Falcone thought he had a lot to look forward to. Him. He thought wrong. My uncle organized a little party at the house in Margate nine days before Christmas. He was already there waiting for us to arrive. Lawrence had a Thunderbird at the time and he was driving. I was sitting in the passenger seat and Vincent Falcone and Jerusalem Lanner were in the back seat. It took us about 10 minutes to drive from the office on Georgia Avenue to the house in Margate, which was right on the beach. Now my uncle's in the living room of the apartment on the second floor and to get up there you had to climb a set of wooden steps that were adjacent to the outside of the house. The house was a two-story duplex. It was cold and windy and it started to get dark and you could hear the wind coming off the ocean. Looking back on it, it was kind of eerie. I was wearing a black leather jacket and it was zipped all the way up and I had a 32 revolver tucked in my waistband. Lawrence and Joe Salerno were ahead of us. And talking as they went up the stairs, Joe Slater had no idea what was going to happen, but Lawrence did. 
Now Vince is a few feet in front of me and I'm behind him and we're going up the steps. But he's kind of hesitating, like he's uncertain of what's going on. He said, where's everybody at? I thought Chucky was coming down. I put my hand on his back and said, he'll be here. Let's get inside and make some drinks and kind of usher him up the steps. His antennas were definitely up, but I had positioned myself behind him. So if he decided not to go up or up the steps, or if he tried to get away somehow, I would have blasted him right there. When the four men reached the top of the steps, they walked into the apartment where little Nicky Scarfo was seated on the couch watching a football game, waiting for them. Little Nicky Scarfo didn't just want Vincent Falcone to be killed, he wanted to be present when it took place. This wasn't business, it was personal. While most powerful mob leaders would seek to insulate themselves from the murders they order, Scarfo wanted to bask in them and personally savor the experience in any way he could. The Falcone killing also provided Scarfo with the opportunity to commit a murder alongside his nephew to literally bind the two men together in what was becoming Scarfo's never ending bloodlust. To little Nikki, the entire universe seemed to revolve around three things the mob, murder, and family, specifically in that order. The killing of Vincent Falcone in the matter for he foresaw gave him the chance to combine all three of these at the same time in one giant orgy of death, lineage and La Cosa Nostra. When we talked, Vince kind of froze and I continued to usher him inside to break the little bit of tension. And that was in the room. I said, come on, Vince, let's make some drinks. My uncle, who was still in the living room watching TV said, hey, Vince, bring me a cutty and some water. Now, at the time, Lawrence was in the dining room area talking with Jerusalem, kind of distracting him. That was all happening within seconds of us walking into the apartment. So we grabbed the bottle of scotch from my uncle and put it in the kitchen table. And then I said, Vince, get some ice. When we started walking away towards the refrigerator to get the ice, I reached into my jacket and then took the gun from my waistband. I walked right behind him and blasted him right behind the right ear. As soon as I shot him, his body propelled forward just like what happened to Louis DeMarco and they crash into the refrigerator and crumble to the floor. All of a sudden, Joseph and I starts going nuts. Here's the news clip of Philip Lanier on primetime television singing in his words of what happened as he approached Vincent Falcone's final moments. To prove himself, he had to deal with a guy from the neighborhood named Vince Falcone, one of Phil's friends who had managed to insult Scarfo. The two of them invited Vince over for a couple of drinks. I picked the bottle up, the scotch bottle, start drinking it to try and break the little bit of tension that was there. And uh, I said, Vince, come on, get some ice. It's in the, the refrigerator. Come on, let's make some drinks. He came in, he, he went to the refrigerator and opened the freezer, and that's when I shot him. How many times did you shoot him? I shot him once in the back of the head, and after he fell down, my uncle listened to his heart, and he said to shoot him again in the heart. And I shot him again in the heart. Do you, do you not feel any sort of... What do you feel? I feel nothing. I don't feel nothing. I feel cold. Probably one of the most effective that I've ever seen. In vivid detail, Leonetti describes the scene of the crime when he murders Vincent Falcone in cold blood. He makes clear that Scarfo is calling the shots. I was watching TV and he was making sleep. And Leonetti's testimony does permanent damage to the Philadelphia mob, which never fully recovers. Scarfo himself is currently serving out a life sentence in a maximum security prison in North Carolina. And Leonetti testified, and he ultimately had. All of a sudden, Joseph starts going nuts. He says to my uncle, Nick, I didn't do nothing. And then to me, Philip, I didn't do nothing. He's like hyperventilating. My uncle watched the whole thing. He's watching as I shot him. Now he's going down from the couch and comes and tries to calm down Joe Salerno. He says, I know you didn't do nothing, Joe. Relax. Everything's going to be okay. Now Lawrence was standing two feet away from me when I hit him and somehow his eyebrows caught on fire it got singed 
from the flames of the gun. So my uncle is trying to calm down Joe Salerno. Vince is on the ground bleeding, and Lauren starts complaining about his eyebrow being on fire. So I say, Jesus Christ, Lauren, you knew I was going to shoot him. Why the f*** were you standing so close to him? With all of this going on, my uncle managed to calm Joe Salerno down. My uncle comes over where Vince is lying and kneels down to the next to him. He says, he's still breathing. Give him another one right here. And he moves Vince's jacket a bit and points it to his heart. So Vince is lying there and there's a pull above forming underneath him. And he's like gurgling, trying to breathe. And I stood over him, raised the gun and shot him once more in the chest. The impact of the second shot caused his body to jerk. And then it was it. He was dead. At this point, my uncle was ecstatic. He jumped to his feet and said, The big shot is dead. Look at him. And he kind of mocked him by gesturing to the body and calling him a piece of shit, a sucker. He actually was cursing at the corpse. Now I have the gun in my hand and I turned to Joe Solano who was standing right there. I looked at him dead in the eye. He said, He was no good, mother. I wish I could bring him to life so I can kill him again. I was prepared to kill Joe Salerno too. I didn't give a f I would have shot him right there on the spot without any hesitation, but he stopped carrying on. Scarfo then resumed his role coach and articulated precisely of what would happen next. He didn't miss a beat. He said to Lawrence, you drive Philip back to the office and bring Vince's car. Me and Joe will stay here and clean up. Now Lawrence drives me back to Georgia Avenue and I take all of my clothes off, putting them in a bag, and get right into the shower, scrubbing under my nails the whole bit, just like I had done with after the Marco head. Now I'm dressed and I go down this office, and Chucky and the blade was there. We were all waiting for my uncle to get back. Now I see someone walk by the window, and I recognize it's Maria from across the street. So I go outside to see what she wants, and she tells me, that she knows that Vince's car had been moved and did I know where he was? Now, what was I gonna tell her? Yeah, he's in the trunk of his car and I can't say nothing, so I said, I don't know where Vince is. After she leaves, I go back into the office with Chucky and the Blade and while we are waiting for my uncle to get back, I call up my friend of mine named Joe Disco, who was a DJ at a local radio station. He picks up and he says, hey, Philip, do you wanna hear a song? So I tell him, yeah, Joe. Play the song, Do or Die, and he plays it. Now, Joe Disco was related to Sam Scafidi, who was a captain under Angelo Bruno, based out of Vineland, New Jersey. Sam Scafidi was one of the guys who helped my uncle when they killed Rex Caruso. I'm thinking if I get charged, I can bring Joe Disco as a witness who would testify and I had called the radio station. Joe Disco never knew the real reason I called. Vincent Falco's body was found a few days later, hogtied wrapped in a blanket and stuffed in the trunk of a Mercury Cougar. He had been shot twice, once in the back of the head at point blank range and a second time through the heart. The Philadelphia crime family members tied Vincent Falcone's corpse into bedsheets like a mummy and then dumped the body in the trunk of his car, the old school mafia hit. A few days later, after the murder, the police were doing an investigation investigating Philip Leonetti and his entourage. And then Philip Leonetti lies to them and saying he doesn't know where Vince is. And the police were convinced because they knew that was his friend. But eventually, Joe Salerno, who was trying to recruit himself in the mafia, had turned against all the Philadelphia crime members and started explaining everything to the police that led to the arrest of Nicky Scarfo, Lawrence Merlino, and Philip Leonetti. The trial was so big that at, by the time these mobsters were arrested, the 1970s were over. It started the whole new year, 1980. 1980 will also be the year that the godfather, Angelo Bruno, will be gunned down and the whole structure of the Philadelphia crime family would change forever. And also one of the pivotal stages is the trial of the murder of Vincent Falcone. Vincent Falcone this murder trial was one of the most prolific ones in mobster history in 1980. And many will wonder, is there any justice for any mafia member, especially for one who was trying to recruit himself into the big leagues but was never a made member? However, the verdict for all members of the Philadelphia crime family, Lawrence Merlino, Nicky Scarfo, and Philip Leonetti, 
were all acquitted. We find Nicodemus Scarpa not guilty, Philip Leonetti not guilty. Joy was in the air, tears of joys were shed, and celebrations poured into the hearts of the family and friends. Nikki Scarfo was so ecstatic that when he was asked about the status of the jury members, he said, Thank God for the American jury system, an honest jury. Thank God for the American jury system, an honest jury. And Philip Leonetti was also there to accompany when he said that most famous quote. So therefore, was there justice for Vincent Falcone? Or this was justice considering the ties that he put himself into? The murder trial of Vincent Falcone, it became one of the most televised news reports before you had 24-hour news channels like you do today. This was the late 1970s, so seeing a trial about a murder, especially of the crime family member this was very new at the time and it was being televised stationed on radio stations and it became one of the most watched moments in philadelphia and atlantic city history at the time since phil bianetti has been acquitted of vincent falcone's murder he has now confessed that he was the man behind the trigger that ultimately killed vincent falcone in his book mafia prince and he has no regrets about it because he said before that him and Vincent Falcone were in the life he was either killed or be killed and he has not regretted this to this day he has been on platforms with Patrick Bet David on the Value Entertainment channel which you can see the full video and you can hear from his own words that we will also show you in this interviews I figure I'm doing the right thing for the family he's talking about my uncle he's cursing him saying he's crazy and he's not doing the right thing so this is what we do. This is what we are. We're killers. I mean, especially with my uncle. So you shoot him once, and then what happened? Shot him once. He fell down. My uncle said, shoot him again. He tested. He, he wanted to see if he hurt a heartbeat. But... So I shot him again in the chest, and uh, that was it. Then I left. He told me to leave and get rid of the gun and all. They tied him up and put him in the trunk of his car and parked his car uh, in market somewhere. So they put him in the trunk of his own car? Yes. And then parked it in a market? Yeah. Now, at that time when you're doing this, are you worried about fingerprints? Are you wearing gloves? Is there anything? Oh, yeah, we had gloves. We cleaned up the blood, which you really can't clean up blood. But, I mean, if they hit the black light, you'll see where blood was. But there was no evidence that we were there until Joseph Lerner started testified against mm -hmm. this. As we mentioned before, Vincent Falcone had died on December 16, 1979. He was only 30 years old. Very young. But, of course not surprising in the world of the Costa Nostra. His mother would die nearly four years after his death in 1983. She and Vincent Falcone are both buried in Atlantic City Cemetery. Maria, Vincent Falcone's mistress, had later started dating Filonetti a few years later, and eventually they have gotten married and started a family. Of course, many people may wonder, how could she have married someone to like this? Did she immediately had intentions on being with Philip Leonetti? According to Philip Leonetti, he said their relationship did not just start overnight. Eventually, as time went on, so did their relationship and they figured that was nothing more weird or disturbing about it. Now, of course, many will question their motives even to this day. In fact, some people also believe that she was Vincent Falcone's wife, but she was only his mistress, just to have a full disclosure. Here is another ironic story. Vincent Falcone's killer, Philip Leonetti, Philip Leonetti's mother, and his grandparents are buried at the same cemetery where Vincent Falcone is. In fact, the Scarfo family tomb is just a hundred feet away from Vincent Falcone's resting place. This is a very similar story like the Holy Cross Cemetery in Yeni, Pennsylvania, 
where many victims and murderers of the mob are buried close to each other as well. And as you can see, Vincent Falcone is buried beside his mother. And as you can see, you can see a picture of his mother, Rosario Falcone. But you still cannot see a picture of Vincent Falcone, even on the little mark that's above his name. But we will show you his images that we only can cover from news archives. This is the story of Vincent Falcone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching this video. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out more of our content. Feel free to give your feedback and suggestions on who we should do next in the comments. This is Infinitely Productions. We love you.